And uh, what we're going to do today is one return your graded homework. So if you graded somebody else's assignment, you should hand it in right here um, so that I can get them graded by the TA on Wednesday. Um, if you, two people seem to have forgot to bring their assignments in. So if possible, put those in my mailbox um, on Monday morning. So sometime on Monday before class. Just put them in my mailbox in the math building, okay? Preferably in the morning. Um, also, one person seems to have lost the assignment that he's graded, which is the first time in the history of this grading system. But um, uh, we'll, was somebody doing a project that had something to do with primality prime testing? Or prime finding. Was he named yeah. Igor? That sounds like the name that was probably on it. Igor Tolkov? Yeah, Tolkov. Okay, this guy may have lost your assignment. Um, is your assignment something that's printed, or was it handwritten? Or? Ah, so maybe you could email him your assignment. And then he can grade it and give it to me by Monday. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, and make sure you exchange email addresses. <laughs> Saved. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so that's the first thing, homework. Two, we're going to talk about floating point numbers, part two. Um, also, if anyone here is very interested in number theory or cryptography, there's going to be two talks this afternoon in the math department in B36, or C36, I guess. So, um, so the, I guess it's, is it C36? C yeah, C36 in Belford um, at 345. Alice Silverberg, who is a cryptographer at UC Irvine, will give a talk. And then John Coates, who is a number theorist at Cambridge University, will give a talk. And um, if you're very interested in number theory or cryptography, you may be interested in going to these talks. So this one will make us something to do with cryptography. This one I'm sure will have nothing to do with cryptography and might be uh, extremely advanced, but um, uh, there it is. And by the way, John Coates was Andrew Weil's thesis advisor. He was the advisor of the guy that proved Fermat's last theorem. So he's a pretty famous number theorist. Okay, so what we'll talk about today um, is floating point numbers. Oh, another announcement, there's a SAGE seminar running, and next Thursday the talk will be by Josh Cantor on Cython, like the internals of Cython. So if you want to understand how that compiler works under the hood, that will be the talk to go to. So that's going to be on Thursday at... Uh, 3 p.m. in C401. Okay, so um, today's talk is about floating point numbers and interval arithmetic. And what I'm going to do is go through these slides and really make some remarks about um, what floating point arithmetic is in a computer from a more basic level than I did last time. Last time I was much more user-oriented. And then presuming that I um, completely finished these slides, I will go back to the slides from last time and continue giving you a demo of the various different ways of computing with floating point numbers in Sage. Okay? If I do not have the time to do that, then um, you'll want to look over the slides from last time on your own time. Okay, so here's a fun quote. Um, well, first, when you, some you know, mathematicians, especially when they come to a program like Sage, will try out some area of functionality and it will behave much more differently than they expect based on their mathematical experience. For example, I think a typical mathematician who hadn't done much computation could easily start working with floating point numbers in Sage, that is, you know, decimals, um, and conclude that they're just completely broken. In fact, they would have that experience with, with all math software, and, um, and there's a reason for that, and uh, I'm going to try to give you some insight into understanding that floating point numbers aren't just broken, they're just or maybe they are just broken, but that's just the way it is. Uh, and you just have to understand it and live with it. And it's not an isolated case. I mean, there's a lot of different computational things that people do, which if you um, approach them from a pretty naive but theoretical point of view and just start trying to use them in a computer, you may get the conclusion that the entire thing is just completely broken. But your conclusion isn't really right. It's more that um, there's a lot of subtleties when you want to actually compute with mathematical objects, and you really do need to be aware of them. Of course, here's a, a fun 
quote that I found, floating point numbers are like piles of sand. Every time you move them around, meaning doing an arithmetic operation or something with them, you lose a little sand and pick up a little dirt. So um, when you think about computing with floating point numbers, think about that quote. That every single time you do anything with them, you got some dirt, you lost some sand. That's a good image to have in your mind, I think. And it's, um, this quote is from some slides for this course that are very nice. So you might want to look at the link to that course. Okay, um, the first thing I'm going to do in this demo for you is I'm going to set real number equal to float. The impact of doing this is that whenever you type in an explicit floating point literal, such as 0 0.1, in Sage, henceforth, instead of it being interpreted as a Sage floating point number, which has its own semantics, which are different than um, C doubles, it will be interpreted as a Python C double, i.e. as a float. Behind the scenes, what happens whenever you type a floating point number into Sage is the following. Um, what it does is it pre-parses the input line. So if you type 3.1415 directly into Sage, like I did right here, um, what really happens is the string 3.1415 gets pre-parsed. There's a function in Sage that takes any input you type, turns it into um, another string, and that string is what actually gets fed to Python. So um, when you work with Sage, you aren't exactly working with Python. With um, Python, you're working with Python, but with some sort of pre-parsing that happens before the code gets sent to Python. Another uh, very vivid example of this is when you do one third. If you compute it in Sage, you get the um, the rational number one third back. However, if you look at what really happens behind the scenes, is that when you type one third in, Sage applies a pre-parsing function to it and creates a sage integer called 1 and then leaves the slash alone and then creates a in sage integer called 3. All the integer literals are wrapped with integer and then the number in there. Um, if you were to directly do one third in pure Python, which I'll do from the command line right here, actually I'll use the system-wide OS 10 Python. Um, look exactly the same. Oh. Okay, so that's the Python that comes with OS 10.5.1. 10, 10 uh, if I type one third, what I get is not one third back, I get back zero. This is because in Python, the semantics for integer division are stupid. And uh, they work just like in C. It gives you the floor division which is extremely lame and confusing, but that's what it is in Python. In uh, Sage, what happens is that still Python has those semantics. We don't change them at all. But whenever you type an input line like one third, it puts integer around each of them, and the semantics for dividing two um, objects of type integer is that divide gives you an exact rational number back. Okay? So um, the main reason I'm pointing that, this out again is that I'd like to make it so that for a little while in the Sage notebook and in my demo, whenever I type a number in, I get the Python version of it. Um, and what happens if you pre-parse it and you set real number equal to float, this is just float of that string. And that just gives you back a C double wrapped via a very light Python class. So um, that's the reason that I did this. I did this to set it so that every time I type in a decimal, I get back a double precision float. So it's a very powerful thing. If you wanted um, every time you type a decimal in to get back a real number um, with, say, 1,000 bits of precision, you could type this. And then when you type in a number, you get always a real number back with 1,000 bits of precision. Okay? So this is the way to set somehow a global mode for how real numbers are used uh, or are, are interpreted. When you type in a floating point number, that's, this is how they're interpreted. Um, so I'll keep it at float. Okay, so there's this. Um, the first thing you notice about Python floats is that they're really internally stored in binary and they're printed in decimal, and that's why you get the funny two at the end. It's because the number 3.1415 cannot be represented exactly in binary. It, so it's approximated by a number in binary. The number in binary has that expansion right there. So it's potentially confusing, but um, 
I'll say some more about the uh, representation of floats in a moment. Okay, so moving on, here is an example where we're using C doubles or Python floats. They're exactly the same thing. But we do a sequence of if and else's. So what we do is if 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 is equal to 0 0.3, we print yes. Otherwise, print very weird. And then you do 0 0.1 plus 0 0.3 is 0 0.4, print yes, or very weird. Notice that in the first case, it prints very weird. So in a computer with double precision floating point numbers, 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 is not equal to 0 0.3. And it's because when you do, um, well, it's just because these numbers can't be represented, or not, or rather, they are not represented exactly using um, IEEE 7 whatever double precision numbers. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is just give you a bunch of examples to show you that floating point numbers are very broken. Of course you know this because I, you did a homework problem before where you had to show this. But here's an example where the associative law fails. Notice that I take um, exactly the same numbers and add them in two different ways using the associative rule and I don't get the same thing back. There's a rounding error, so in one case I get four, in the other case I get three, nine, 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 eight. They're different numbers. So there's some sort of uh, rounding that occurs. Likewise, if I try to try the distributive rule, um, right here, then again, look, um, if you're we're working in a ring, then you definitely have these two being equal, but look what happens. Um, in one case you get this number, in the other case you get a slightly different number. And this one ends with 1, 1, and this one ends with 2. So they're different. So the associative law fails, the distributive law fails. Um, here's another example just to show how, how bad this can be. Um, here I compute <coughs> something which is certainly 0, x squared minus y squared minus x minus y times x plus y. But when you substitute in specific values of x and y, especially if they're pretty close, then what you get out is um, it doesn't look that much like zero. It's zero to some precision, but I mean, every, in a sense, every single decimal digit of the answer is wrong. Um, yeah, every single one is completely wrong. So watch out for that. You should um, never compute something you know the answer to. <laughs> you know it's zero, you set it equal to zero. You know it's one, you set it equal to one. Yeah. So here's the definition of IEEE standard 754 double precision arithmetic. Um, so I'm going to describe it, and it's what's being used behind the scenes. And a lot of computers implement this um, IEEE standard for double precision floating point arithmetic very, very quickly in hardware. And uh, the number of times that you can do a floating point operation, like a multiplication or an addition, that's one of the standard benchmarks of a supercomputer, the number of times it can do a floating point operation per second. Um, so this is, this is the representation. You have 64 bits to start with, so it's a 64 bit, bit double precision arithmetic. And what happens is you take your number and you encode it as much as possible as follows. So there's a sign bit, which says whether or not the number is positive or negative. There's an exponent, which is 11 bits. And that, um, what's happening is that your number is being, rep well, it corresponds to something that looks like some decimal uh, expansion. Times 2 to the power of some exponent. And this part right here is it's given right here in the fraction and the exponent is given here. The exponent can be either negative or positive but uh, the way that it's actually stored either negative or positive is kind of funny here and I'll define that exactly in a moment. So in a computer when you type in a double precision floating point number what it stores in one 64-bit word is that. That's the sort of information it stores. And now here's a precise description of how to go from one of these to an actual double precision number. So there are a couple of special cases. There's a not a number case, a man, and that corresponds to E. I'm going to go up slightly so you can see the E part, the exponent part, um, right there. That corresponds to E being the binary number 2047 and the fraction part being non-zero. So that's a special case 
When the exponent's that and the fractional part's non zero, that means not a number. Um, and then there's some other cases that represent minus infinity and plus infinity. So these are special conventions that were chosen to represent these numbers that come up. So for example, if you do a calculation and it overflows, so you compute um, you know, a huge number times another huge number and the result is so big it doesn't fit in this representation, you get this special sentinel which represents plus infinity. And that's much better than having it say wrap around and give you completely random nonsense that you don't understand, um, which is what happens with C ints. With C integers, if you, you know, multiply two together, add two together, and the result doesn't fit in a C integer, then it just wraps around and gives you something that's seemingly random. Um, whereas, at least with floating point numbers, you're notified that something overflowed instead of getting a completely wrong answer. Um, and then the real interesting parts are here and here. Uh, zero less than, I think that's an E, not zero, certainly. So, because zero is always less than 2047. <laughs> Um, so if E is less than 2047, then the number that is represented by that list of zeros and ones, that, six, that list of 64 zeros and ones, is, um, uh, is what's given here. Okay. So then you subtract off. So then put the zero in the middle. Yep, that's, that's certainly right for the exponent. Um, so you put the zero, in the, you balance it so that the zero is in the middle. Um, oh, right, right, okay, so. Is it one? I mean, by default, you always assume that the leading digit is one. Right, right. That's right. Yep, there it is. So um, that bit stream, or that, link to, that list of bits corresponds to this real number. Minus one to the sign, um, a certain power of two, that's where the exponent comes in and then a decimal number, 1.f. And there's, remember the only, it's not really a decimal number, it's a binary number. The only digits are 0 and 1. And there'd be no point at all in having a 0. So you put a 1. Um, so f is just a list of zeros and 1s. So that's how an IEEE floating point arithmetic uh, number is represented. And there's, see, there's another case down here. If the exponent is 0 and f is non-zero, then there's this other case. Um, right there, and that's uh, one very particular number, and then uh, there's some other cases here. That for, I mean, it's hard to represent, you can't represent zero like this, right, because there's a power of two times a number that isn't zero, so you have a special case here to represent zero, and you also have a minus zero. So this is IEEE double precision arithmetic. There's also a single precision analog of this where your, your numbers are 32 bits. And this is implemented very, very efficiently in all modern hardware. So, um, single precisions, uh, actually a lot of hardware implements say only single precision because that's what's most relevant. Single precision is just almost exactly like what I did up here, except you have 32 bits instead of 64 bits. So you have less bits for the fractional part, less bits for the exponent. And uh, when you're doing computer graphics applications like video games and graphics cards and that sort of thing, um, then you don't need as much precision, let's say, when you're doing scientific computing. And so often, um, graphics hardware and video game hardware will uh, implement, at the hardware level, very fast floating point arithmetic, but with single precision rather than double precision, or even less. Do you know if there's an IEEE standard for quadruple precision? I don't think there is. Um, there is a library included in Sage that does quadruple precision called quad double. So I guess it's really eight tuple precision because it's four doubles in a row. Yeah, that's always written in software, is that the idea? It is implemented in software on top of this. I don't think there's an IEEE standard for it. And in fact, there are the um, algorithms that they use for doing arithmetic in quad double are not proven to be correct. So, and in fact, they give you, there's, they give you kind of funny, wrong, slightly wrong answers in the lower order bits. So um, it's on theoretical shaky foundations. Um, and in fact, there was a lot of discussion on the Sage development list very recently about exactly this issue of quad double um, being fast, but giving you potentially funny stuff on, on the lower digits. Okay, so that's double precision. And you can, you can change things in a lot of different ways. I mean, you, could, you can have, you know, 1,000 bit precision numbers, et cetera. So uh, there you are. Uh, MPFR builds an arithmetic model on GMP, but the definitions are a lot like IEEE, except that 
um, the exponent's allowed to be um, arbitrarily large instead of stick, you know, fitting in this little piece of a number. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, otherwise, it's very similar. And a lot of the real work goes into the rules for addition, multiplication, subtraction, division, and so on. So all I've done so far, I haven't given you any rules. I've just said what a bijection is between 64-bit um, sequences, you know, 64-bit pieces of memory, and some funny subset of uh, the real numbers. So that's all I've given you. Uh, really a subset of the rational numbers, because all of these are given exactly as rational numbers. Um, but there's also rules for what happens if you add together two or multiply two. So what you're supposed to do if you multiply two is you round to, um, you round to one of these floating point numbers, and then there are various rules for how you do the rounding. Do you always want to round to the nearest one? Do you want to round towards zero? Do you want to round uh, somewhat randomly depending on some property of the number, etc.? And there are theorems about um, which sort of rounding is probably the best thing to do, which I won't talk about. Okay, so now we're going to do a little exercise. Uh, my keyboard is not doing anything. That's not good. Okay, Firefox decided my keyboard doesn't work suddenly. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, okay, so if I compute 10 to the power of 308 as a float in uh, Sage, I get this number, which is very large. If I compute 10 to the 309, I get infinity. So why is it that 309 causes an overflow? Why isn't it 1023? Because you're raising 2 to the power as opposed to 10. Exactly. Um, but I'm writing 10 to a power rather than 2 to the power. So I should be able to do, uh, say, 10 to the 1022 as a floating point number. Actually, 2 to, sorry, two to the, yeah, so I can do that. But I can't, I should have problems if I try to do that with, uh, maybe 4 is actually where it, yeah, so I can do 1023, but I can't do 1024. So it's, the, the definitions I gave you, everything was in base 2, but often you end up typing in base 10. I notice the output in Python, when it writes number e, and then it gives the exponent, that's an exponent in base 10, not base 2. So watch out for that, because it's not given anywhere in the notation that it's base 10 rather than base 2, so that could cause a lot of confusion. But it is the natural base to use, because you're printing the number out in base 10. Um, here's a fun example where I just write a little bit of Cython code. What I'm going to do is use the system printf function to print out in scientific notation doubles that I type in. So you can see what C does rather than Python. Should of course be very similar. Um, so this is the standard C library doing the printing instead of Python. So you can see various examples. So you can see that the C library by default gives you like six digits after the decimal point. Python gives you as many as it knows. Um, you could change the code up here where it says percent %e. You could put in some additional specifier so that C would give you more decimal digits if you wanted. OK, so um, just a quick summary. Floating point numbers are like piles of sand. Every time you move them around, you lose a little sand and pick up a little dirt. That's floating point numbers. So interval arithmetic is another approach to computing with floating point numbers, where you know how much dirt, you, 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 you have a bound on how much dirt there is. And it's really a pretty simple idea. Here's how it works. Um, instead of doing arithmetic with specific numbers, you do something that's more rigorous and feels more mathematical. Namely, if you have two numbers, um, instead of thinking of them as specific numbers, think of them as intervals, where the interval can have width, a very, very small width. Um, so take a little tiny interval around each number. And then define, for example, multiplication of two intervals to be all possible multiples of all possible things in the two intervals. In other words, you get a new interval <coughs> with the property that if you have one number in one of the intervals, another number in the other interval, and you multiply those together, they would absolutely definitely lie in the new interval. And you just make the um, intervals be 
uh, given by two IEEE floating point numbers. And this gives you something that works a lot like floating point arithmetic. And it has the advantage that whatever answers you get won't be potentially completely random. Do you, um, aren't you have the same problem? With, well, so you've got n points there, a plus c and right. b plus d. Those are computed as floating point numbers. That's right. They're, but the, different, the key difference is that the answer, whenever you do any sequence of arithmetic operations, millions of them, tens of them, whatever, at the end of the day, the answer is an interval. And the true answer, the true number that you would have got if you used your real number to infinite precision and had some you know, magic method to do it, will lie in that interval. And that's guaranteed. So um, it keeps track of how much error could have possibly occurred without you having to do any, um, you don't have to analyze the algorithm. You don't have to know anything about how floating point arithmetic works. It's just at the end of the algorithm, every answer will definitely lie so, somewhere so in that they, interval. They don't actually use floating point arithmetic to compute they do. plus C. They take the yes. smallest. No, they, they use floating point arithmetic, but then they round then they, to, right. so to minus they infinity. Rules and they have, no, well, they, IEEE doesn't, I don't think it has just one rounding rule. It has different rounding rules that you can use. So when you compute the lower endpoint, you round down everywhere. So you're always getting a lower bound on the, the lower endpoint. When you compute the upper endpoint, you round up. So, and then you come up with um, clever algorithms for computing you know, transcendental functions like sine and cosine and so on, where the input's an interval and the output's an interval. You come up with an algorithm for like Newton iteration, for example, where the input's uh, given by a function involves intervals and the output's an interval, that sort of thing. So um, there's a whole like, industry of coming up with algorithms that make sense for intervals. And there are some problems where intervals are really good and useful, and some problems where they're not useful at all. And I think it, it just depends a lot on what you're doing, whether they'll be useful for you. I personally found them useful mainly uh, in my own research where I, uh, I have a, an expression that maybe just involves 10 or 15 different quantities. And I know each quantity to a certain number of digits of precision for sure. And I just turn all the little quantities into intervals. I do the arithmetic and then I see the answer. And I know by a theorem say that the answer is supposed to be an integer. So then I just look to see if there's a unique integer in the interval that I get. And if there is, then I'm done. I know that that had to be the answer. If there isn't, then I have to compute everything to higher precision. And it's nice because if I were to try to do that same calculation just using floating point numbers, I wouldn't trust the, I just get some answer at the end, and I could say, find the closest integer, but I mean, maybe, I, maybe it would just be wrong. I, I can't really trust the output. And I want to compute all the input numbers to the lowest possible reasonable precision, because every extra digit of precision might be much, much harder for me to compute. So that's an example where I've personally found it useful. But other people use interval arithmetic for much different things. Um, the guy who implemented interval arithmetic in um, Sage, Carl Witte's main interest, I think, is in doing geometry that's related to making screensavers. And um, he needs to, he does all kinds of uh, arithmetic in algebraic number fields. So, it, so he's, they're geometric constructions. So he ends up with all these um, algebraic numbers, numbers that are roots of polynomials. And he wants to very quickly do lots of arithmetic with them. But at the end of the day, he wants to say, find some relation between them and know for a fact that it's right. And what he does is he does all the arithmetic with intervals instead of um, polynomials modulo something. And uh, then he can just keep increasing the precision and provably get the right answer. So um, in geometry, it can also be relevant for various geometric constructions. It's mainly motivated by wanting to do things fast, but not giving up on rigor, which for some calculations, numerical an analysis just isn't good enough to give you something that's rigorous. Are there interval libraries for computing sine, cosine, exponential logarithms? Yes. Sage includes one. And I will show you an example. Uh, so now, what I'm going to do, it's a real interval field. There's a real interval field and a complex interval field. These are um, objects in Sage. So just like, you know, you know about polynomial rings, there's so many different little rings in Sage. Real interval field is just yet another ring in Sage. It's not really a ring, maybe, but um, so something like a ring in Sage. And it has elements, and those elements implement lots of different functions. So let's make the interval from 0 to 0 0.1, for example. Uh, what did I do wrong? Oh, I think I need to get rid of this. I'm just making up the notation, and I'm getting it wrong. Which is a real number. Oh. Oh, I see what's happening. Um, I changed it so every float literal is already a real interval field thing, so I need to turn that off for a second. 
if I'm going to enter a floating point number. So I'll write re. <coughs> okay, that command makes it so real numbers are just treated in the original way. And um, now I'm going to make A be the interval from 0 to 0 0.1. There it is. And now I can do A.tab and see all the different functions that are available on intervals. And you can see that there are a couple. There's um, like hyperbolic cosine, cosine, exponentials, um, sine functions, square roots, that sort of thing. So yes, Jim, there's a library in, in Sage. And this is a very optimized library. So the first thing you did, you fed... Oh, oh, I just fed the lower and upper bounds of the interval into so that's RI. So si that's the size of the interval? Is that no, it's the lower bound and the upper bound. So this is the interval that starts at 0 and ends at 1 tenth, or at 0 0.1, actually. OK? No, not OK. No, I mean, so you're going to do a cal calculation of numbers that are in that interval? Is that That's right. So watch what happens what if I do a squared. What do you, what, if I do a squared, what am I going to get? I'm going to get an interval back. What interval? You're talking about that interval. Yes. Zero to zero point zero one. Yep. So basically, zero to zero point one, modulo the fact that point one isn't representable in binary, and therefore there's going to be some something funny at the, the very lower end of this. And um, there you are, 0 0.01. And what it did was it said, OK, the squaring function for positive values is increasing. So all I have to do is compute the lower bound, the uh, square of the lower point in the interval, and the square of the upper point in the interval. And that gives me back the interval as the answer. OK? And that's all. Tons and tons of algorithms are encoded like this. And it's, um, it's really part of a library called MPFI, multi-precision floating intervals. It's a pure C library, which um, I think builds on MPFR and GMP. And if you're writing a C program, you could download that library and install it and then link your program into it. And Sage just happens to also do that. Yes? Can you give it a number and then tell like the precision and it will make its own interval? Or do you um, need to I don't know. I don't think so. But let me look. Yeah, it looks like what you'd have to do if you wanted to make an interval of a given radius is that you'd have to do something like um, 5 minus epsilon, 5 plus epsilon, where epsilon's the radius. Okay. Like that. Okay? So you just have to, you have to get the lower bound and the upper bound. So here's an example where now we're going to switch mode so that any time I type a float in, I get a, an interval back. And first, I'm doing exactly the example from before. Are these equal? Now remember, what's happening now is they're all being replaced by little tiny intervals, where um, these intervals, if I type, say, 0 0.1, look what happens here. So what's happening here is it takes 0 0.1, a decimal number that's exact, but does not have an exact binary representation. And it rounds it down towards minus infinity. It rounds it up towards plus infinity. And it makes the interval that goes from the rounding down um, to the rounded up version of that number. So the width of the interval is the machine epsilon then? Is that the idea? I That's guess so. Well, I guess so. That's what it looks like. Yep. Um, 0 0.1. Oh, what is it? Dia absolute diameter. Probably one of these two is, well, one of the two is. Oops. Well, it can't be the machine epsilon because it's not. So the constant. relative diameter looks, it looks right. That's yeah. roughly what the machine epsilon is. 16 digits of decimal precision is. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. So now, 
There's another thing you can do, though. So, you know, equality testing, well, it really asked are the intervals exactly equal. And that's not going to work, I mean, because they're rounding and stuff. They're not exactly equal. But you can ask whether they overlap. Right? Is it conceivable that they're equal? And their things behave very nicely, as you can see. So here in this particular example, if you make the interval that contains 0, 1 and the interval that contains 0, 2, the sort of smallest interval that contains these two exact numbers, that overlaps with the interval that contains 0, 3. So it imposes some sanity, but that's, we have to also understand you know, that you have to use overlaps rather than equals. Because the equal sign really means the intervals are literally at the same lower and the same upper point. It doesn't mean there's some possible way they can be equal. It means they're the same intervals. OK, let's try the uh, associative law. Look, it's, they're not, um, you don't get exactly the same intervals, but they do overlap, which is nice. Let's try the distributive law in the same example that failed before. You don't get, actually here you do end up getting the same intervals, and of course they overlap. Um, here's also the example where We, took, um, we did some sequence of floating point operations, and before what we got was this number that looked you know, roughly like this. And for all you know, if you didn't know what you had fed into your machine, you just did some complicated algorithm, you had an input, and you got back this, and every single digit's wrong, it should be zero. Um, here what you do is you get an interval, and that interval contains zero. So when you get this answer, you think, well, okay, I don't know, you know I don't know what the answer is, but I know whatever it is, it lies within this little tiny interval around zero. So you have, it's just more, it's somehow more rigorous, and it has its applications. Um, here's a fun example where we, we like to understand the function 1 minus cosine of x over x squared. So using floating point numbers, we just plot that function. Um, so we're plotting it very close to zero, and um, of course you, there's going to be all kinds of issues with cancellation, but um, here's what you get when you just naively plot it. Um, this is potentially misleading. And you, you know, this is a normal thing that a lot of people will do. If they want to try to understand some function, they'll just plot it. Where they stick floats in, they do the arithmetic, they get floats out. And you might think that the function you know, is kind of a, a really weird function. All I've done is plotted it in some little interval around zero. And that's what I get. Using intervals, we can also make a plot where it'll give us the, an upper bound on the value of the function at any point and a lower bound on the value of the function at any point. Making the plot is very fast because it's just doing arithmetic with pairs of floats, and that's actually very fast. And here we see that, hmm, something's up. What happens is the line that's on the top, that's an upper bound on the value of the function. Basically, as if you did upper round, you know, rounding up always. This is what you get if you round down always, um, and can do with intervals. And you see that the true value of the function at every point lies between these two. So the fact that these aren't on top of each other should be a warning signal to you that the true plot of this graph is going to look some, like something that's you know, wedged between these two functions. So you get more information from the intervals than what we had above. Above, you could have been completely misled, and you would think, well, that's what the function looks like. Here, you just think, well, hmm, OK, it looks like some function that's bounded above and below by these two which still is you know, not very helpful, but at least you're signaled that there's something funny going on. Now, if we um, up the, the precision, we can make the same plot using 10,000 bits of precision. So this uses MPFR. This is the uh, library I told you about a little bit last time. You make the real field whose elements are represented by things with 10,000, um, you know, the, the number is 10,000 bits of precision. The exponent can be very, very big. And now let's draw the same plot. So all we're going to do is compute 1 minus cos y over y squared, but where the inputs have much, much, much more precision. And let's see what we get. And there you are. You get just a horizontal line, which is what that looks like close to 0. So um, the two plots, the first plot is extremely misleading. The second plot isn't lying at all because the true answer does is a function that lives between those two um, plots. So the true answer does live between the two. So that's not misleading. It just doesn't give you too much information. Okay, it doesn't tell you anything that's wrong. Though, whereas the previous one literally strongly could potentially strongly mislead you. Um, here you get the truth when you increase the precision a lot. <coughs> 
Okay, um, so that's interval arithmetic. You can use intervals in Sage wherever you want. Um, for example, you can make a random matrix over the real interval field. So this is a um, that's a random three by three matrix, each of whose entries is an interval. Now you can do the full uh, suite of linear algebra operations with these intervals. So you could, for example, square the matrix. Uh, this is kind of boring because these are all integers. Uh, let me make a better matrix. Um, so A equals matrix, whose entries all have to lie in the real interval field. Make it uh, 3 by 3. Two thirds, five. Just making up random entries. Minus pi e e square root of two. Okay, so there's a random matrix, it has entries that are interval. The intervals are all small, but some of them are actually non-trivial because of uh, the inability to represent some of these numbers in binary. And now let's do something with this floating point matrix. We can take its square, and you get an answer that involves intervals. You can compute its characteristic polynomial, and you get a polynomial whose coefficients are intervals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, you don't get the exact pure poly, but you know that, for example, the coefficient of x squared is a floating point number, a real number, that lies within that interval, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So for some applications, this could be really useful. And this will work, I mean, literally, I mean, everything in Sage that works with fields, generically, will work with these intervals. Um, I'm not making any claims about speed. If you start trying to do this with a 500 by 500 matrix, I don't think you're going to get very far. But for some applications, it could be just fine. Okay, so any questions about interval arithmetic? I was going to find the website for MPFI multi point fuel injection system. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> okay. oh, here it is. Or, yeah. MPFI multiple precision interval arithmetic library. And um, here it is. So you can read through the docs and so on. And Sage itself, of course, has part of the reference manual is about um, interval arithmetic. You look at documentation, reference manual, interval, fixed fields of arbitrary precision, real intervals, right here. So you can read about real uh, MPF, you can read about using intervals in Sage here. And what all the issues are. How much slower is it compared to the normal floating point? Not that bad. Um, the main problem would be if you try to do higher level algorithms like care poly and so on. The issue being that they aren't, there aren't specialized implementations mm -hmm. for intervals. Um, basic arithmetic is quite fast. You'll remember that last time we were timing doing one a million multiplies on a lot of different systems. So let's, or with a lot of different representations. So, um, oh, because I've, let me reset. We store real numbers to their default. Okay, so remember that the benchmark here was about a quarter of a second. And now let's do the same thing, but with an interval. Be pi and then pi plus 0 0.001. Okay, so now this will just give you a sense of whether intervals are, you know, arithmetic is insanely slow or reasonable. So you can see that there's, it's like a factor of three or a little bit more. So it's not like a factor of 100 or anything. Um, the difference in speeds probably is just a little more than double because you're doing twice as many things plus just a little Python overhead because floats in um, Python are optimized as much as you could possibly imagine. 
But if you take a matrix and compute it, uh, maybe you do a like squaring a matrix, it's just going to use a fairly naive algorithm for doing the matrix multiply. So that will slow you down. Yes, Robert? Well, compared to my like real double field, this is what it's um, No, it isn't. Well, for what? I just did a benchmark and it was three times slower. Real double? Real double is slower than Python floats. So ah, okay. uh, we could do real double, but really slow to Robert Bradshaw in the back means three times slower. But I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't consider that real slow. I would consider that okay. I consider 100 times, or 10 times slower really slow. So yeah, real double field um, actually is very pleasantly above, is exactly the same as float in my benchmark. I think that. That seems weird. I'm two seconds of that loop over my. Wait, is, that. is an empty loop? Yeah, so like an empty loop is 0.15. So, um, so that's so subtract that off. Right? So here, you, I, okay, that's a good point. Then that means that I should be subtracting off 0 0.1. So that's um, really about 0.7 versus 0.15. Um, good point. And then there's the module dictionary lookups so assigning to be and stuff. Well, but still, I don't know. I mean, a factor of four or five. That's not a huge. That's not vastly slower. It's a bit slower, but it's not a showstopper at all to use. It doesn't um, seem like it's prohibitive if you need it. It seems no. like pretty reasonable. Yeah, yeah. It's probably a lot faster than how much time you're going to spend doing numerical analysis. So. Okay, so um, I have a. I did not get to show you the rest of the slides for the Python types and the Sage types, but I'll just tell you that um, there's a discussion here with a bunch of examples for real and complex double field. And then after that, there's um, you know, timing comparisons. Then there's a discussion of real quad double field, which is quad doubles, which Jim sort of asked for. And there's some examples here. And then there's a discussion of multi-precision floating reels. These are reels where you get to say, OK, like 100,000 bits of precision, or 10,000 bits of precision, or whatever. And then it does all the arithmetic with that. So it's very nice, very, very powerful system. And it's platform independent. And when you, when you just type in a floating point number to Sage, that's the default. If you do, for example, this, and you haven't changed anything, it will make a multi-precision floating real with a little bit more than the number of digits of precision that you typed in. OK? So if we look at the current of this thing, it's a real field with 243 bits of precision. So it doesn't just throw away the lower bits if you type a number in. Unless, of course, you type real number equals float. And then it literally will throw away the lower order bits because it will turn it into a float. Okay, so that's RRMCC. And then um, intervals I already showed you. And Perry itself has floating point arithmetic, as does Maxima. So I encourage you to look through the worksheet that's posted here. And I'll see you on Monday when we're going to talk about root finding and optimization of uh, single variant functions in Sage. Okay, so I'll see you on Monday.